Welcome everyone to another broadcast of the Soul of the Everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. All past broadcasts are podcasts. Find them at artistfirst.com. We welcome your questions and comments. Please use DJ at artistfirst.com. And now here they are, Michael and Margaret Lines. And here we are. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I, I, may will, I may lose the will to live halfway through the show. Oh, dear. But it's okay because life is meaningless. Oh, are we in that mode? No. <laughs> no, and that's what tonight's show is all about, and that we are never in that mood. Mm-hmm. But Albert. Can move. Not Uncle Albert. Who was also a little depressed at times. <laughs> Maybe it's the name. Albert. Albert. But, uh, yes, Albert Camus, who famously uh, lived his whole life in an absurd way. Mm, yes. So let's lead with a quote from Albert. Albert. Would you like to quote him? Sure. This is the soul of every man, by the way, in this odd kind of beginning, sorry. Now, the quote. (laughs) The realization that life is absurd cannot be an end, but only a beginning. And Margaret, this whole show for the last six and a half years has been absurd. We started it. We started (laughs) it in an absurd way. Oh, yeah. And, And, you know, in this quote from Camus, I think everybody who spends any kind of, any amount of time reflecting on your life runs into this feeling of absurdity mm-hmm. or a feeling that, you know, what is the meaning of life is some, sometimes the way it's succinctly put. Right. And this is where you get people with their bucket lists and... You know, they're gotta haves and, um, you know, their midlife or end of life crises, you know, or the this existential question, you know, what am I here for? What's my purpose? We we talk about it a lot. And I think, I think that Tolle has that answer as do many of um, his sort of Years. But but we have that answer too, I mean, and by we I mean all of us. I think intrinsically in our hearts we feel that we do that our lives are not worthless, that our lives are worth living. But when you hand that to the ego and let it chew on it for a while, the ego says, "Well, I can't find any meaning, so there can't be any," mm-hmm. because the ego is rather self-referential. <laughs> it likes to find. It likes to consult itself as its as the higher authority on everything, and Camus, I believe in this uh, in this particular quote and in many of his quotes in his early life and early thinking came right up hard against this almost immediately, that he couldn't find any meaning in life, and so he and his buddies Nietzsche and Sartre and a few others all went down that sort of um, dead end nihilism path you know life is meaningless so shouldn't i end it or why am i hanging on just for nothing right he basically was he was basically saying that if you follow it through logically then the end of that whole process has absolute nothingness and that's where his concern for suicide came in. Hmm. Because if you find meaning only in what you understand or what you think you understand, and you can find no meaning, uh, you are in a dark place. Yes. There's no, no life to be had. Basically, your mind is, or your your logical process is handing you 
through your own amazing processes of reasoning, absolutely nothing. Right, a null set. And so then if you get to that dark end and you're staring into the abyss, literally, mm-hmm. literally and figuratively staring into the abyss, there's only one way back. And Camus took that way back. And the way back is, well, then life is absurd. And uh, I think the term may escape some people, what absurd means. But uh, absurd means just ridiculously improbable. Or, or, or really, you know, a, another word to use, which wouldn't be, you know, as as profound, would be silly. Life is silly. It's pointless. It seems uh, to be, you know, some sort of a cosmic joke. Okay. But you can walk backwards from the abyss and not jump in by just saying, okay, let me accept the fact that life is an improbable absurdity, that it just is, and so. In that, there's a grain of a wonderful truth because you throw away what Margaret just said. You throw away the ego. The ego has reasoned you into this dark corner. And what you basically say to the ego is, you're staring into the abyss and you found no way out. And I just say, I call shenanigans on you, mm-hmm. ego. And mm-hmm. I say, you're just silly. Yeah. Actually, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the definition of absurd is extremely unreasonable incongruous or inappropriate that's one two impossible to take seriously silly the synonym is foolish yeah of relating to or manifesting the view that there is no order or meaning in human life or in the universe that is the definition that uh, Camus was Leaning towards right, and, and it and it does, Margaret. It does walk you back from the abyss. Yeah, you don't have to jump in, but it does. You leave something behind, and and it's an important thing that you leave behind. You leave behind the surety of ego and the surety of reason, and you, if you think about walking back from the abyss, but really you break through. You take a leap of faith, and you say, oh, "Life is absurd." Mm-hmm. But let's take the step further and say. Well, we'll just accept that, and that's a that that gets you towards the tole position, which is that life may be absurd, but it all exists within your consciousness, and the part of you that's telling you that life is meaningless, in and of itself, requires your consciousness to exist. Right. The universe, tole takes it further, requires your consciousness to be perceived, to exist, in fact. And so that you, first of all, are vast. You, the being, is not the ego which reasons itself into this dark little corner and says, there's nothing, I can't go any further, so we might as well end it all. And you just say, well, you're absurd, mm-hmm. <laughs> ego. And I'm going to you know, just sit over there and be quiet in the corner and stop, you know, worrying about yourself i'll call upon you when i need you but for now your powers of discernment have really led you down to i don't know what or who or why i am the powers it's not discernment even it's reasoning they've reasoned themselves into a corner you've reasoned yourself you've literally reasoned yourself into a dark corner Mm -hmm. and reason alone and this is the this is the most profound point that Camus came up with in all the well, I don't think Sartre and the other ones did, but Camus came up with it, is that reason alone cannot get you out of this. But absurdity can. Right. You just say, Well, I'm gonna live anyway, even though it's silly. Mm-hmm. And I'm gonna accept that I'm a silly person and that life doesn't have to have a meaning. And the universe doesn't have to have a meaning. And in fact, if you go one step further, they shouldn't have a meaning. But what should? Well, if you look at it in terms of life, uh, cannot be ca- contained in reason. Mm. Very good, yes. You know, the reason, reason it's too vast for reason to encompass. And because it's so vast and it, uh, it cannot be understood by reason. 
it basically says, well, that means it doesn't exist. Nothing matters. Right, and then you because go, I have no answer for you, then nothing matters. And, and then you go, you're silly. <laughs> well, this is foolishness. It's foolishness. And to sit back and say, yes, this is foolishness. To acknowledge that, it basically allows you the first step in realizing that the reasoning aspect of you has an appropriate place, but it's not all of you. Hmm. It's again, it's it's a tool that you use to interact with your environment, but it's not the only tool. It's hmm. again, if every if the only thing you have is a hammer, hmm. then everything looks like a nail. Hmm. So I'm going to hammer this and hammer that, and it's not working. It, it's the would you agree with me that it's the self limiting case? Of reason. reason. Reason reason, moves itself to the point where it cannot go any further. And then it tries to say, well, this is it. This is the end. We just have to jump off. And the self-limiting case is it breaks reason out of its dominant. It, it tries to say, I am everything. I, I, the ego, the little I, because it's hard to talk about all the different eyes, but the little I, the ego has spent a long time telling you in its little ego voice that it is everything and that you should pay attention to only the things that the ego thinks about. Well, it's a little ego, but it has the biggest mouth that it, you could possibly it's hear. It's a very loud little it's, ego. It's loud. <laughs> but then when you get it, when it, re it reasons itself, it gets to the self-limiting case. It takes itself a very, very smart ego with all the education in the world and every degree that it can find Reasons itself to the blind, dark alley, and says, "Oh well, this is it. We've, there's no meaning in life. Let's just end it all." Well, okay, but but is... but let me finish. This okay. this is the most important bit, Mark. Is that when it, when it hits that wall, and the rest of the being goes, "Well, that that's just silly," and it breaks the ego out of its dominant position. It puts it into the place of, "Well, well, you that's that's ludicrous. You don't have any. You, you don't know what you're talking about." So let me find the real meaning. Let me put the ego to its proper place. Mm -hmm. Get it out of those driver's seat because it has reasoned itself into a corner. So therefore, I'm taking over the wheel. <laughs> Get out of the driver's seat, you. Right. Well, it thinks that it's that important. Mm. But when you look at it in terms of realizing how much power you actually gave it, and giving in to this idea that um, you can reason yourself into meaning, <laughs> which I find highly amusing. Um, meaning is not the same as knowledge. Yes. People think that the more knowledge you have, then you must know a heck of a lot more. You you must know what the meaning is. I know there are two different things. And it's up to you to experience life, to begin to understand the meaning of things like love, patience, um, Choosing. What does it mean to choose? There's so much to a human life. And most people just want to say, oh, it's only this. That means this. Uh, no. Hmm. No. So much more. Well, and I think that, again, the ego will try to... You know, one thing that happens with the ego when it reasons itself to the dark corner and you... And it breaks away and you say, well, man, maybe the ego doesn't know what it's talking about. Is it then tries to find, it tries to scrabble around and tries to find meaning. So, well, okay, maybe, you know, even though this is the dark corner, that we can find a goal or something that we'll attain. You know, oh, well, okay, we, this looks bad right now, but if we, if we go and get this thing, money or power or, you know, some, Something. some concrete goal, you know, yeah. do this bucket list or... Or this exit, you know, this sort of 
uh, this will mitigate our existential crisis, our midlife crisis. We'll go get the, you know, the the trophy wife and the Ferrari, and then we'll be better, or whatever. The point being is that the ego tries to substitute, um, you know, things, you know, kinds of kinds kind of tries Margaret to paper over the abyss. It knows is standing there. It knows that the this dark abyss of meaninglessness is in front of it, but then it scrabbles around and tries to find things. And you, right. you find many, many people when they have um, ignored the, you know, followed the dictates of ego and the dictates of reason all the way down and, and they're getting close to this abyss and it kind of frightens them because it is, you know, an abyss of, of non-existence. They start to say, well, what is the meaning of my life? And they go back to the ego. So the ego's always had the answer before. Maybe it'll still have it. And the ego hands them things. You know, well, well, you haven't done this, or you, or you should have done that, or, or you, you know, these things, these, these pieces of, of your unfulfillment are, are labeled, you know, this object, or this achievement, or this uh, particular experience. And so it throws these things up in the air, much like a magician or a juggler trying to distract you. And people will start to grab at the shiny objects, say, okay, this, maybe this, maybe this. And each one, as one more desperately than the next, is grasped at and maybe achieved and found to be void and found to be unfulfilling. Right. And, and many of the things bring even a greater sense of of despair or a greater sense of this um you know this this voidness to life this meaninglessness to life because if you continue to allow the ego to hand you new things you will achieve those things but you won't find any meaning in them it's already it's already bounced off the wall and it's only drawn back enough to say, well, maybe if we just find a few more things, a few more things might do it. Bigger things, shinier things, whatever they are. But you you can't get there that way. No. And and the only way you get there is if you really do accept that the ego doesn't have the answer and never will. Mm-hmm. And it 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 will scream. When you do that, it will it will fight you um, almost physically to say, well, no, the world says, you know, nine out of ten doctors agree that this is what you should be doing. Or these are the bucket lists that everybody else is doing. Or these are the goals and achievements. Or look at this one, how happy they are. Or that one, how happy they are. Well, it's it's always taking a thing. Mm-hmm. And when you find yourself comparing yourself there you go. to someone else in a different situation, that should raise a red flag in your head. It's like, it's not about them. It's about me in that respect. They have nothing to do with how I actually feel. Can you Can you grasp that? Can you see that? Well, throwing up this image of saying, well, this is the way I should be. Well, who said? Exactly. You know, you're taking this on some authority that this is the way I should look or where I should be. Is this part of my life or all these like should, should, should. But you never even asked yourself what is it that I am really happy with? What brings joy in my life? Mm-hmm. Have you asked yourself this question? Because you'll find that what answers you is not your ego. <laughs> People say, oh no, if I have the car, if I have the... The, the degree. Well, the, the, the marriage, the house, uh-huh. the children, they go they're through this, this listless list. No, that's a comparative to someone or something. Some standard. And where did that come from? Frankly, it doesn't matter even where it came from. 
why haven't you touched internally the point where joy exists? And what brought joy in that moment? Because most people believe that it's a goal thing. Once I get to this goal, then I'm I'm satisfied or I get my my dopamine hit because I hit this goal. Exactly. And it works for a bit. But then now you've oriented your whole system towards things. This goal. This goal. And not, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not in the journey that that you begin to see your steps. All that matters is reaching the end of that goal. Hmm. Well, you you had. Uh, I'll just remind you of what you were, you told me earlier today hmm. is that there was a study on exactly that. Right. Maybe we can go into that a little bit. Just to just to digress to frame this, and then Margaret has this these lovely uh, this lovely study. But to frame this, it, it it had to do with the joy that a certain group of people, children, had in doing a certain activity. And the, in the way that these researchers, um, in essence, supplanted that joy with, a, with another and then found that, that it had a detrimental effect. So maybe you go into that a little bit because it, it's a good microcosm. Okay. Yeah, I was... Um I was listening to an article by uh, Andrew Huberman, who was a neuroscientist and a teacher. Uh, I forgot the name. It's a university in New York. Um, and basically, uh, he was speaking of this study that he had um, was looking at and it had to be, it was a what he called a, a a goal mindset. It's the result of something. And the reward uh, that you feel, because, because he's a neuroscientist, he basically said that your dopamine hit, which makes you feel good, brings pleasure, um, can be focused in different areas. The study he brought up was that there were... Uh, some children, they're either kindergarten or preschool, and a whole bunch of them just love drawing. So the scientists basically had taken the ones that loved to draw and began to reward them with gold stars for what they were doing. Then after a period of time, they stopped doing that and discovered that the kids didn't participate in creating a drawing anymore, not not as often, uh, because their pleasure or dopamine hit came from receiving the gold star. It was no longer in the process of creating the picture. And that they didn't need a gold star before, but now they do. So their mindset got shifted into going after that star as opposed to enjoying what they were doing as a process. And his focus or thrust had to do with a growth mindset where the reward is in the effort and it's not focused on the goal. To learn how to choose to bring yourself into this growth mindset. Um, and the process itself can be painful. If you look at athletes and they're trying to push the limits of their body, well, your body screams at you when you do things like that. But in the athlete's mind, no. This is a step to, prog- to progress in the right direction. Mm more stamina, more more muscle, more strength, more endurance. And to understand that that 
whole process, when you engage in that, you don't stop. You don't quit when that happens. Um, as a neuroscientist, he was talking about um, how when you begin it, it's norepinephrine, mm. acetylcholine, and dopamine. Those are the three um, neurochemicals. Yes, that help you um, in this process of bringing yourself forward. So what he was saying was um, he was looking at another study on why people quit. And that was fascinating because you know when someone hits a, a certain point, it just, that's it, I quit. And what he was saying was it's because the, the norepinephrine level keeps building and building and building and you have to uh, temper it with the acetylcholine. The acetylcholine is the stuff that allows you to focus in on whatever task it is you're doing. But if it's always the, the norepinephrine, you get to a certain point and then stop. Mm. To continue, you have to interrupt it with the acetylcholine and then as that process goes, the dopamine, dopamine it kicks in, saying, yes, yes, this is a smaller goal in my larger goal. It's like you have an overall goal, but mm. you have to break it down into smaller pieces. So that that's the growth mindset that he's speaking of. And it's actually quite fascinating because um, what he was saying is that you can choose uh, what makes you happy or what brings you pleasure, what sets off the dopamine. And his definition of addiction was interesting because he looks at addiction as a progressive narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure. Hmm. So if it's only this one, the addiction is you've decided it's only this one thing that's going to bring me pleasure. And you do that repeatedly. So you've narrowed down the field where you can obtain uh, pleasure from. Yeah. It's, it was fascinating. It's like, yeah, that does make sense. Addiction is only this one thing, so then you go after it repeatedly. Repeatedly and obsessively. Mm -hmm. well, there's a lot to unpack there, but I, I, I want to start back with the, with the kids. So if we, if we generalize that, mm -hmm. if we look at ourselves, I think all of us can feel at some point in our lives that we had pleasure in doing a thing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's different for everybody. And right. one of the things Margaret said was you ask your heart, what gives you, uh, Joseph Campbell used to say, follow your bliss. What gives me pleasure? What is it that I love to do? And people will say, well, I love to cook. Okay. So I'm going to get, I get um, from the process of creating and making food or eating food or whatever. And we can see that in some of the people we know. Um, I'm I'm getting great pleasure, and and part mm -hmm. of that pleasure is is doing the process. Part of the pleasure may extend into learning new techniques, um, to experimenting, and so all of these are are process. These, you're working a talent. You're working something um, that that gives you pleasure, and and the growth mindset of that activity is that you get a little better every day. So mm -hmm. who are you who are you competing against? Your your referent is not that you want to be, um, you know, in charge of a restaurant somewhere. Your referent is that each day I'm learning something new. I'm getting better at it. I'm, I'm able to create more. I'm able to express myself more. So it's, that's the mindset that these children have. Now, the ego comes in and says, well, we should do something serious with this. We should start a restaurant. We should, we should sell our food. We should do, and this is, this is, Fine, you know, you can turn what gives you pleasure into a career, but if it becomes all about the goal, it it tends to, and people have you've probably seen this in your own life. It tends to wring the pleasure out of it. You're like, right. well, now I'm getting burned right. out. Now I'm like, it's not it used to be fun. It's not fun anymore. It's kind right. of the expression. Right. What that means is that the ego has, has taken what used to be fun and turned it into a grind. Because now you're no longer getting pleasure out of 
of the activity, out of the experience, out of living your life and being yourself in every moment of every day, now your life is narrowed to one goal or another goal and you become addicted to goals. So I can't be happy, even neurochemically, mm-hmm. unless I get the goal, the hit, yeah. the, the, the Ferrari, the big bank. The, and all of a sudden your life becomes less and less and less of your life is pleasurable, is meaningful, gives you, gives, you know, gives your each individual instant of existence um, a, a, an experiential, you know, a, a grasping of life and the living of it, you know, being in the moment. When you're an athlete, training you're in the moment the moment is not that you're going to win the olympics the moment is i'm I'm better than i was you know last yesterday i'm I'm stronger i'm a little faster i'm more able to execute i love what i do you see and then it becomes now i gotta get into the olympics now i gotta do this trial now this subversion of the broad pleasure of the existence that you are the being that you are which contains all these things, including your ego, gets narrowed and narrowed and narrowed and narrowed until it's got to get the job, got to get the degree, got to do this, got to do that. And all of a sudden, you're saying, "Where's the meaning? Where's the pleasure? Where's mm-hmm. where's the where's the being in this? It's just the ego leading me forward to this abyss." Well, this is where you look at it and say, "This is absurd." Exactly. The but the but be. But the careful thing that Margaret's saying, the very careful thing is the absurdity is the narrowing, Mm -hmm. not the pleasure of being you. And you know what we ought to do? Mm -hmm. Is take a pleasurable break. Go back to the studio for a little bit. But but we're going to come back and we're going to talk more about meaning. This is the soul of the everyman on the Artist First Radio Network. Back to your hosts, Michael and Margaret Lines. And thank you very much, C Man. And uh, welcome to the second half of the of the hour. And tonight's show, we're talking about um, well, we we are talking about the meaning of life in one regard. But um, I think where we left off uh, before we went out to the break is an interesting. Uh, area because if you look at our current let's say our current zeitgeist our current times uh, there's sort of an epidemic of people um, who are in essence prosecuting their their life in an addictive way All right and Margaret right. last half hour just said that addiction uh, and this was from I forget the name Huberman. of the Huberman, the you know, neuroscientist, who said that addiction is, in essence, the narrowing of what brings you pleasure. And, and when you are a true addict, you've narrowed it down to one thing. You know, it's, it's it alcohol? Is it a certain drug? Is it a gambling addiction? But any anything that narrows your whole life, so your whole focus becomes obtaining, obsessively obtaining. This one thing. Why? Because it's the only thing through which you see any sort of meaning. The whole, your whole lens has been the, 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 the experience that you're born into, which is this universal experience, this 360 degree spherical experience of the moment of now that you can see in every infant. When you pick up a newborn or, or an infant and look at them in the eye, they're taking in everything has through a, a sort of a nefarious process of pursuing n- ever narrowing goals and ever receding you know ever ever le- ever less obtainable goals mm-hmm. and it has in essence rewired your brain at a neurochemical and physical level and it's rewired your soul 
to focus obsessively on that one little ego thing, that one tiny ego voice. You got to get this, got to get this, got to get this, got to get this, got to get this. Or the, the neurochemical, got it. this is the only place we get pleasure, this is the only place we get pleasure. So it's physical, but it's also mental. And it's leading you to the abyss, to the absolute nadir, the void. And people who are depth, desperate, hopeless addicts often do commit suicide because they can see nothing more than the void and the unobtainability of their, of their next pleasure hit. It, it's, it's the ultimate in despair. It's the ultimate mm. pit. Mm-hmm. And, and one way, you know, Camus' way out... The the step he took away from the abyss was absurdity. Okay, we'll just accept that life is crazy. Life is silly. Life is foolish. Life is foolish. It's it is in and of itself incorrect. Mm-hmm. It is incorrect, but it's a step away from the abyss. And you can step forward. You can step into faith and say, you know, I I understand that this ego voice tells me life is meaningless. I understand that I can find no goal to fulfill me, but I feel in my heart that I, the being, and, and if you start to think about it, what contains all things, my whole life experience, that each moment of now, in, of, in and of itself, has intrinsic meaning. And one of the intrinsic meanings of the moment of the now is your ability to choose what will bring you pleasure? And if you were, when you were a child, the choices were natural, obvious. I like to draw. I, this is fun. I'm going to do this because it's fun. And then I'll do this next thing because it's fun. And, and the world is full of limitless possibilities, all of which can bring you joy. Food or drawing or playing or running or catching. Or, and, and, as we as we focus, as we narrow ourselves, we, we burn our brains out with the epinephrine, whichever one of the chemicals that, that causes us to focus too heavily, to narrow ourselves too deeply, to more and more make it a singular thing, an unobtainable thing, something which I assign meaning to, that the world assigns meaning to, that I buy into, that the ego tells me, gotta get this, gotta get that. And you can see that it's a lie. Your heart tells you, this isn't right. This isn't true. This doesn't have meaning. This isn't what we love to do. This, is, this used to be what we love to do, and now it's just an endless grind. And if you get yeah. to the absurdity, you can kind of push it away a little bit. And then you just say, it's not absurd. It's, it's essential that we not narrow ourselves. Well, the absurdity comes in seeing that you have decided. I mean, yes, to narrow that's the yourself. absurdity. That yes. is the absurdity. If you, because most of that's done unconsciously. Yes. And if you can embrace the fact that you are absurd, and you have narrowed your interactions with other people and your universe to this one thing. Under bad advice. Under what? It, it could have been an advice. Is the default program? Yeah. You know, we all, that well, everyone does it this way. Why, why isn't this working? Everybody can't be wrong. I love that one. That's the best one. The appeal, <laughs> the appeal to, to the masses, the appeal to authority. Well, well every, everybody's doing it that way. It can't be wrong. Everyone's yes, doing it. yes, it can. Everyone can't be wrong. It's like, well, actually. Well, actually. Um, and it sort of harkens back to what we talked about in the previous show, which was the tendency of groups to reach right into the stupid. Well, yes. The limitless depths. I mean, the ego will lead you into the lim- limitless depths of the void, mm-hmm. but so will stupidity. Well, yes, <laughs> pretty much. And um, it's going back to believing that what is stupid <laughs> is it can't be you. <laughs> it's got to be the outside world. Well, and, 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 yes. And 
um, that kind of a, a thought process, it leads you right into reasoned into a corner looking at nothing. Hmm. And if you accept that, that you have to realize this that is a stupid decision. Hmm. <laughs> and, and, and often unconscious decision. I mean, nihilism can be arrived almost, if you just tropism, if you just kind of follow the ego all the way around you, all of a sudden you, you're right up against, your nose is pressed up against the glass of the void, almost unconsciously. And it's all a lie, all the whole way. But the unconscious choice, this mm-hmm. is what I mean. When you realize that you have a choice in this, and there's a lot of people who basically feel this is too much of a choice for me. Mm. You know, do you, they look at this ability to choose uh, and equate it with, with anguish because I'm not doing it right. I can't be doing it right. They're always looking for, well, well how am I supposed to do this? Looking for the authority to tell them how to do it. And the truth of the matter is, it can't be done from the outside in. It's an inside choice. And if you choose anguish, then you will follow the path of anguish. Mm -hmm. But if you choose joy, then you will follow the path of joy. And that seems too simple. Too simple, right? For people. You have to understand your freedom, your ability to choose that freedom is vast. And it's much more than what your mental understanding is. What you think that these are the options and this is the way I could possibly go. No, you're more, so much more. So do you choose a baseline of Joy, are you going to consciously choose, I'm going to live, even if it hurts. Mm. I'm going to live as much as I can in every moment that I have. You know, Margaret, the ego um, loves to reason you away from that, because it says, if you say there, well, I'm going to just be happy where I am. The ego says, well, how can you be that? No one will be happy. This this is a terrible situation. You don't want to be here. Da, 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 da. And, you know... Um, one of one of Camus' um, aphorisms was you have to imagine Sisyphus being happy. Now, just to explain, Sisyphus was a a, a, a Greek myth, a, a god out of Greek myth, who's who was doomed for eternity to roll a round stone up a hill which was very steep and had a very very tiny top, like a point. So that every time he would roll the stone up and just balance it for an instant on the top, it would roll down the other side. And he couldn't stop. This is the ego. The ego is trying to get you to balance the stone on the, on the point and say, if we can do it, we'll be fulfilled. And you get singularly focused, addicted to this task. And Camus says, though, that's absurd. And then what, what we're saying is you choose happiness in the absurd. You say, well, this is my task, and I'm going to be happy anyway. And the world says, how can you be happy doing that? No one would be happy doing that. And you said, uh, and, to, and to spite them and to show them that the truth is really within, you say, I'm happy anyway. I don't care what you say. And these words frighten the ego and the world beyond belief. Because if you can be happy doing anything, then all that they tell you means nothing. Pretty you much. choose your joy and whatever it is that your heart tells you is your joy, do it. And the world will say, what a fool you are. And you say, yep, I'm a happy fool. <laughs> and it drives them crazy. Nothing drives the world crazier than someone who's happy in and of themselves, in their heart, doing whatever it is that they're doing. And if you are happy, this is the prize that they can't attain that the world cannot obtain. They cannot obtain happiness. And they will, they will look at you in, in disbelief and, and in envy, and really at, at, at its basic terms, is they envy someone who can be happy in and of themselves, truly internally happy. Look at a child playing with crayons. 
and and every every Wall Street magnate says, well, what a waste of time. Well, that child is happier than all of them. And if they if that child retains that happiness, they'll be happy for the rest of their lives doing exactly what their heart tells them to do. Well, my question is, are you so frightened of that choice mm -hmm. that you choose not to make a choice at all? That's another problem, yeah. But in doing that, trying to avoid the the pain that can come from making a choice, you have to realize that you've, in not choosing, you have already made a choice. There is a default that happens. And you've chosen a life of complacency. Well, everybody does it this way. I'll just do it that way. And never acknowledging that you have the power to choose and to live a life of intention. It may not look like anything different to somebody else, but suddenly your life has meaning. Yes. Because you're living a life of intention. That, that's a, that's a, a, a wonderful synonym for happiness is living life with intention. I, I'm reminded, Mark, you remember this the little monk living on the top of the mountains with with his basically in a hovel and his pleasure was having a couple of extra spices. But you, you would look at that and say, well how can someone live in this this icy hovel on top of a mountain? There were two things. He was living his life as he wanted to live it with intention. And he was happy. And when you saw his face, it shone through. His happiness and his contentment and his intention all wrapped up into one. And his concentration of, on the moment of now, the focus, which gives you 360. It gives you everything. When you are addicted to the endless goal that you can never attain, you have nothing. You have this tiny little... It's like the cave, like Plato's cave. You have this tiny little dot you can see through, and, and nothing else matters except these shadows on the wall which you can't get to. Nothing else matters except the thing you're addicted to, the goal, the goal, the goal, the goal. But if you're, if you're living your life with intention, as your heart dictates, in the moment of now, wherever it is, even if it's on a hovel on top of a mountain with a couple of spices, you're happy. You're living life to the fullest with intention and, and fulfillment, meaning. And you can have it anywhere. You can even have it in, in all of these pursuits, as long as you understand that the pursuits are absurd. Mm -hmm. but, the, but the meaning of life is in the living of it and, and getting there and looking at yourself and your heart and saying, yes. This is my choice. This is my intention. This is where I want and need to be. I'm exactly where I need to be in it, the moment of now. It has nothing to do with comparing yourself to anyone or anything else. Right. You are internally quite aware of what you are doing and how you are doing it. Exactly. When all of you is present, because it has to do with consciousness, but when all of you is present and you take in what is unfolding around you in so many different ways, it's all your senses as well as perceptions outside of the five senses. That fullness where everything in you agrees that this is the choice that you have made, all of you has made. There is no regret in any form mm. or what could have been. All of you are in this one point of decision and one point of movement. Mm. 
the fullness of that is mind blowing. Mm. It really is quite mind blowing. Mm. Doesn't mean that you're in a, a pleasant situation. No. That's what people confuse. They think that, okay, then this is my, my pleasure point. And it's like, no, you don't understand. The joy that comes with the fullness of being is different than physical pleasure. Mm. It can be an aspect of it, but it's different than physical pleasure because the body comes along with it and says, oh, I never realized it could feel this way. Mm. Because it's only focus. Again, you're focusing on solely that one um, thing that you believe gives you pleasure. And that's believing only specifically in a body pleasure. Mm -hmm. Right? It goes way past that. Way past that. Because your being is way past that. Not, Not just the body. But your emotions and as well as your your mind and your soul and your spirit. And it coalesces in the soul as a memory. A memory that can be replayed over and over again. Bringing you back to that point of pure joy. Hmm. And it ends up in your in your eternity bank, if you will. Those this life well lived, these each individual moments of intention, of true fulfillment in being, become your life story, become your life song. It becomes your life song, and it has you, your life song, which in choosing joy and and in following the path that you are here to lead, which is not the pleasure path, it is your path, may be very difficult, may be the hardest thing you ever did, may may take you into death. But yet, if you're walking the path which is yours to walk and yours alone, it will be the most meaningful thing that you could do because it's, it's truly the meaning of this incarnation was to walk that path, being in the place that you're supposed to be in and knowing it with intention, living it step by step, being better than you were yesterday, just compared you to you, and then bringing that home. Well, it's, it's again, following um, that full soul, spirit, mm. heart path, an yeah. incarnation of the divine within the physical body. And I, it's, how do I say this? It's the acknowledgement that the life itself is not always a, um, there's highs and lows. And it is part of the song that you will sing mm. when thing when you are no longer in body it's it's understanding that you're you're not the sum total of the actions or events around you okay because that's what most people think it's like well who i am is just the sum total of, of what i've done and what i haven't done and da, da, da. no that's why that's where it becomes a burden mm to to travel your life path. And that's not who you actually are. You've narrowed it down. You've narrowed your life down into, well, what happened to me, so therefore I'm this. Mm. No, no. It's your response. Bring that bright light that's deep within you out. Yeah. And... We have reached the end of our hour. That was absurd. Life. Life. Absurd. It's absurd. And I'm Michael Lyons in an absurd way. And I'm Margaret. <laughs> and thank you for listening. 